All right, we kick off here in Nigeria. It is earnings season, an absolute glut of corporates releasing their half-year uh, earnings, second quarter uh, also inclusive as well. Uh, Transcorp, uh, Transnational Corporation, PLC, uh, releasing their earnings for the half-year period. Let's take a look at some of those figures. 82 billion Naira in revenue, 31% growth there. Operating income, 46% year-on-year climb. Operating expenses, 40% year-on-year, 15.9 billion. Pre-tax profit, 18.5, up by 39%. That's, of course, the conglomerate includes energy, hospitalities. Let's go to Dangote um, Cement and take a look at Dangote's uh, earnings as well. They, of course, 38% uh, year-on-year growth in revenues, gross profit climbing by 43%. They did see a drop of 14% in their pre-tax profit. Uh, profit after tax up by 4% to $69 billion. That's in the industrials. So, and energy and uh, industrials. Now we go to energy, oil and gas. Seplat, of course, in the upstream uh, market in oil and gas sector. They also reporting their earnings. Now, Sepla does report its earnings in dollars, but it's uh, of course, we've got that conversion over in Naira. 7% growth in their revenues. Now, gross profit, a drop, 24%. Operating profit, also a big drop, 78%. Pre-tax profit down 93%. My gosh, what happened? Profit after tax, 43%. What happened? Who better to answer the question for us than Mustafa Wahab, energy and infrastructure analyst. Mustafa, it's been a while. You've been away for too long. Well, yeah. good to have you back in the studio. Um, I'm excited. To be I'm glad you're excited because I'm excited as well. The Falcons are also yeah. playing right now, so yeah. we're very excited. Hopefully, they get a win for us. Okay. Let's start with um, with Seplat. We saw you saw those big drops year on year. What's going on? What, what do you make of the Seplat numbers? Uh, okay, so if you look at Seplat on a Q2 standalone basis, it, the result was underwhelming. Yeah, on the top line level. Um, revenue was down. I mean, forget the naira parts. In dollar terms, revenue <coughs> was down <coughs> almost, you know, twenty percent. You know, P, uh, I mean, I think it took Seplat almost twenty-five billion dollars in tax credit to actually avoid reporting loss this year in Q in Q2 um, alone. Yeah. Right. Uh, but um, Rotus, if you look at Seplat share price performance last week alone, they did almost nineteen percent in a share price rally. Yeah. And the key question, I mean, the key logical question would then be, um, they reported. A really underwhelming performance, and then share price is going on. What's what's going on? Yeah, what's, well, what's, what's uh, happening? Explain that. Right. Uh, so I mean, this is not to say that. I mean, I don't want you to throw a jab. I mean, to say I'm explaining um, an event that already happened. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you have a video evidence of me. I've been singing separate praise for I mean, a long for time. Now, yes, yeah. yes, yes. So what happened is that last year and and perhaps early this year. Seplat is actually laced with huge amount of litigation. I mean, and beyond that, also um, significant amount of corporate governance issues. Um, start with um, almost near collapse deal with um, MPNU, number one. Secondly, uh, the CEO was also facing um, black backlash um, regarding you know immigration status, you know, um, and lastly, um, uh, minority shareholders were also you know throwing a huge amount of you know litigation um, against you know Seplat. Uh, but I think this year um, portfolio managers starting to see that that noise regarding corporate governance issues and also litigation around Seplat. Is actually dying down slowly, right? So the impact of that just basically means that you know Seplat is probably you know now um, sitting down to do business in at least in H1. Uh, but beyond that, H1 numbers as well. I mean, if you disregard Q Q2 uh, yeah. poor performance. H1 is a, a relatively really great, you know, um, numbers. Uh, for um, our viewers, H1 is half year, yeah, right? H1 that's what is half year, yes. Fine. That's, that's <laughs> what I meant. Yeah, but in H1, revenue was actually quite solid. Uh, PAT was also marginally, you know, great. You know, and so what, what we're saying is that HQ1 performance that is strong was enough to really keep, you know, Seplat on track to actually deliver, you know, solid full year numbers. The cost of goods sold rising 30 yeah. percent. Um, the notable uh, one notable increase that um, we saw in their cost of goods sold yeah. was the um, fuel and power, where mm -hmm. they spent, I think, what is it now? Um, about what is it? I think it's they, quite a 70 or so. No, sorry, actually, that's that is uh, that's that's Dango system. I'm jumping yeah, ahead. Yeah. <laughs> I'm jumping ahead. Hold yeah, on a second. Yeah. The the, the well, actually, let's put that back up. The I think this is what you're referring to with, yeah. refer, with reference to um, the uh, litigation and so on. Yeah. So, the yeah. there it is professional and consulting fees yeah. 13.1 billion. Is that the 
Is yeah. that the litigation issues? Or? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Um, that's I, an 800% climb. Yeah, it's 800% jump. And obviously, it has to do with you know, what I just dis dis described regarding all the issues Seplas was facing yeah. in 2022 and obviously early this year. I mean, if you actually check um, 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 general and admi administrative expenses, and the key driver there is this, you know, about 24 billion. I mean, 24 billion that they actually spent, mm. you know, to actually, you know, um, fight, you know, litigation trouble and also, you know, ensure that the CEO actually um, reinstates his uh, immigration status in the country. They mentioned that in the report as well, that yeah. it's been fully, it's been fully um, yeah. it, 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 reinstated. Yeah. The income, there was, wasn't that income tax credit that they got yeah. Q2 that yeah. boosted the, the figure? What, yeah. what, what was that about? About $25 million. Um, that's what they did. Um, wow. So, so what happened is that Seplat's number was actually quite great, but two things actually dented the numbers. The first uh, part is around um, $90 million in other income that they actually reported, a negative number for that. And the key driver that, um, in that regard was actually um, um, exchange losses on some of their Naira, you know, assets, right? I mean, if you remember, uh, gas, um, um, they sell gas indexed in dollars, but they actually expend in Naira. So some of the receivables that they, sell, uh, that they sold to you know, Sapele Energy and other, you know, key um, um, off-takers that they sell their gas to, they actually pay them in Naira. So the translation impact of that was what basically drove that, you know, significant, you know, um, and translation loss that Seplat actually reported in the mm. period. And the other part is also this GSA, right, um, um, litigation um, issue that it faced this year. Um, my, I, I mean, my, my suspicion is that going into the rest of the year, that number would actually, you know, come down a little bit. So the impact of that would probably support, you know, profitability in, in, in full year 2023. You started off by mentioning the stock. 1,693 is yeah. what we had as of Friday's close. Um, I think it started a bit flat this morning. But... 50 something percent um, climb. Yeah. Um, well, what's, the, what's your outlook since you've been bullish on the stock? I guess. What's, what's your outlook <laughs> for the stock going forward? Yeah, so Rotus, I, I was telling some of my colleagues recently that I mean, we think to, we need to start to rethink, you know, separate valuation. You know, so first is that, you know, when you value separate on an NAV basis, so what you see that would happen is... Wait, so yeah. NAV is net asset value, net, right? Okay. Net, <laughs> net asset value. Of, yeah, okay. What you see is that, and I mean, I've also tried to try to yank off MPN from separate valuation. So if you look at separate on sorry a, one yeah. more MPN was the mobile mobile pro, uh, units. units yeah okay fine so when you yank it off and you use you know NAV to value separate so what you'll be seeing separate valuation around is around eight hundred to nine hundred right but I think market is sort of now starting to price in that MPN into the valuation right so at one thousand six right what you would imagine is that market is already thinking that you know cash flow that is accruing from MPN is already you know going straight to separate financials even though the transaction has not been sanctioned you know by the government so i guess um, that's why we need to start to think about markets you know reflective valuation rather than using you know core valuation core asset valuation that we typically use for separate so what i've done is i've raised you know i've reduced my you know um and NAV uh, valuation and SEPLA to around, you know, 40% and then allow, you know, EV, EBITDA and 2P um, 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 multiple to value SEPLA and then yeah. raise that to 60%. So the impact of that just basically means that, you know, as we are at current levels, um, there's still a lot of values that SEPLA can deliver, right? Um, I mean, I'm looking at valuation of roughly around 2,500 if MPN actually push through. That's if the transaction push through. Yeah. Uh, so what I've seen SEPLA done is that they said they've signed an SSPA SSPA is a um, share sale and purchase agreement. They've extended it. So the implication of that is that they are trying to ensure that that transaction between them and MPN uh, concludes this year. And the last time we heard from management, what they said is that, look, uh, they are already making headway. They've spoken to the president, and then they are already engaging with um, um, the NMPC and UPRC, right? So, I mean, possibly start that we'll see Steplatz announcing this year that you know, the transaction has been completed. Because, I mean, if you recall, Rotus, um, this transaction has been signed already since Forever. 2021. Yeah. And cash flows accruing from MPNU has been, has, has been coming to Seplat since 2020. So whether or not the transaction is approved today the or next year, the cash flow is coming. So, ah. so, I mean, I guess that's why, that's how market is starting to think about Seplat this day. So the implication of that is that you know, the market is also bullish as I am on, on the stock. Yeah, and of course, EV, enterprise value, EBITDA, yeah. earnings before interest yeah. tax. Yeah. Okay, um, now we go to, to great, great stuff on seven. Let's get to um, Dangote Cement yeah. now. The, um, let's take a look at the, the, the earnings, the, the numbers. 
Um, revenue up by 38% year on year. Gross yeah. profit was a 43% climb. Yeah. The pre-tax profit did drop by 14% uh, percent though. Yeah. So as far as the revenue drivers for Dangote, what, what were you seeing? Is it sales and raising or rather price? Was it price driven? Yeah, so let's, let's distill it. Yeah. Uh, so Dangote is divided into Nigeria and Pan-Africa. Nigeria actually contributes roughly 60% to their EBITDA. You know, Pan-Africa does the rest. So uh, prior to now, um, Nigeria is typically the key driver of Dangote's earnings. Because I used, I used to tell people that, look, Dangote enjoys the, mo the most in Nigeria. Because, I mean, how do you explain a, an EBITDA margin of 58%? You don't get it anywhere. Not, you know, with almost the biggest, you know, cement company in the world, US, Germany, and whatnot, right? So, but in this half year and in this quarter, uh, what typically, what actually drove Dangote's result was not Nigeria. Because Nigeria has been struggling at, for at least two years now. Because, obviously... I mean, purchasing power I mean, is, is a bit, you know, um, really is struggling, squeezed. Yeah, yeah, squeezed. Yeah. Um, government's also not spending as much as they, they used to do on infrastructure. So the impact of that is actually affecting volume. Although last year, I remember that Madina actually blamed, you know, gas challenges in Obajana. This year, what they said is that cash um, crunch in Q1 was actually the key driver of the volume decline, right? Uh, but if you go to Pan-Africa, the key driver of that volume was from Ghana, um, Ethiopia, and also in, from Congo. Um, so in Ghana, Dangote actually launched uh, around 4,000 metric tons new grinding plants. So they started producing in Ghana. So Ghana's volume were, were up by almost 26%. Um, last year, if you remember, too, in Ethiopia, there was, there was um, civil unrest in Ethiopia. I think yep. I actually bought flight tickets to go on holiday in Ethiopia <laughs> before, before they actually announced that they are not taking Nigerians because of the civil um, issues, right? So um, this year... Civil unrest has been a bit, you know, um, lower, and then so Dangote is able to sell a lot more. Um, also in, in Congo, Dangote is now having to uh, is now able to export clinker to Cameroon. So the implication of that is that um, cement volume for uh, in Congo also um, almost doubled. So I mean, if you disregard Nigeria, the key driver of the revenues for Dangote this year in in Africa and in Q1 is actually from Pan African business rather than Nigeria. Solid. You see, Mustafa, yeah. this is this is why we have you on the show. Right? This is why we have to break <laughs> these things down. Yeah. Okay, now this was the start I was mentioning earlier by mistake when I was talking. We we're talking about step life. Yeah. The the cost on power, the mm. uh, cost of goods sold, is thirty percent um, climb. Mm. Um, how much fuel and power? How do you spend a hundred billion naira on fuel and power? Uh, yeah. So what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Come on. You know the cement um, production is actually heavy on on fuel yeah right and i and i know for sure that um, dangote lafad boa they've actually learned their lesson and so what they are trying to do um i don't know how much fast dangote is actually doing this is that they are trying to you know ensure that they are having multiple energy sources from gas to alternative fuel to i think they, they've all disregard lpf also they are now using af and gas and, and also coal as well. So I think the implication of that is, is just basically means that they are trying to sh ensure that they are re removing FX impact on their cost base. But I mean, it can't be done completely because gas, you still have to pay in Naira, but denominated in dollar. So one, one, when dollar goes up, you have to pay a lot more, right? But versus what we would have seen maybe in a year in 20, 2017, and today, I think cost-based increase is actually a lot more manageable mm. versus, you know, about four or five years ago. Great stuff. I'll, another, I want to ask you about their um, selling and distribution expenses. Okay. The um, haulage, this is yeah. very interesting here. Yeah. The haulage um, uh, was up 12%, 70 yeah. billion. So yeah. what, what's that? Is that logistics moving yeah, um, yeah, yeah. the trucks up and down? Yeah, that's, that's logistics. Um, if you do a lot of road travel in Nigeria, you will see massive amount of truck across Benin or, or a road, you know, go to the north, you see massive amount of truck, not just for Dangote, uh, for Bua and for Lafarge as well, right? And, but, I mean, I think the, good, the key question you, sh you would have asked me really is that if there was railways and whatnot, uh -huh. maybe that would have reduced, you know, haulage costs. But, uh, yeah, that's, that's possible. But the implication of that is that it requires huge amount of um, 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 capex yeah. to actually lead that from the government side of things and from the private side of things. Now, let me tell you what they are doing. So rather than, you know, diesel is actually quite expensive. It's a deregulated market. So, so diesel is used to rock, run, you know, all those trucks. So what a lot of those cement producers are doing is that they're actually converting some of their diesel truck 
to CNG truck. CNG is a lot cheaper than diesel. I think by about 2.5 times cheaper, actually. I know um, Lafayette is actually huge on using CNG to drive you know, their trucks. I don't know what Dangote is doing. Um, maybe they're also doing it, but maybe not. Uh, maybe once we see Lafayette numbers, we'll sort of understand how much that CNG truck is actually helping them you know, neuter the impact of this, you know, um, higher diesel, you know, prices that we're seeing in the markets, right? So, um, I mean, my advice is that, you know, they actually should wrap up that significant investment in converting, you know, diesel trucks to CNG. So the impact of that will actually obviously help them save, you know, huge amount of costs. Great stuff. Uh, very insightful. Mustafa, hang on. We're going to take a quick break and we'll be right back to continue this analysis of the industrials with Dangote Cement. Uh, it's the Global Business Report. Uh, do stay tuned. Welcome back to the Global Business Report here on Arise News. It is still earnings season in Nigeria. We've gone through uh, Seplat uh, Energy uh, with uh, Mustafa Ohamu, who is, of course, an infrastructure and energy analyst. And we're, of course, still going through Dangote Cement. Uh, Mustafa, thanks for sticking around with us. We appreciate your, your, your time here. Um, okay, so we've gone through the haulage costs. We've gone through fuel and power. Finance income, finance ex uh, expense. Saw a decline of about 50-something percent in finance yeah. income. Um, and an increase of about 68% in uh, yeah. interest expense. So what was happening here? Is it, the, uh, is, it, is it a rising interest rate environment? Is it not? What was happening? Uh, uh, so on the income level, I think there's, we still need to ask management question on re regarding that. Because yeah. if you check um, Dangote's uh, cash balance, what you see is that between last year and this year, they've almost doubled their cash balance uh, from 190 billion to about 300 billion. So, I mean, technically, you should expect that finance income should go up, but in this case, actually went down significantly. So, I guess um, during the conference call, that's some of the questions that that's some of the questions that I would actually ask, you know, management, you know, for clarification on. But on the finance expense leg, uh, so two key things is going on there. So, first is that uh, Dangote actually took around 190 uh, billion um, cash this year from CP uh, commercial paper. So the implication of that is that uh, their uh, financial liability actually went up significantly. So, I mean, it was not surprising that uh, finance expense actually went up. Uh, on the other hand, um, they, are, they also have some FX nominated loans on their book, just a tiny bit, a little bit. Uh, and so the Naira revaluation impact of that also meant that you know, financial liability also went up significantly. So I wasn't surprised at all when I saw that you know, finance expense actually jumped you know, significantly for the company. Thanks for mentioning FX expense, mm. or FX rather, mm. because of course this is what's been making the news with a number of companies yeah. in different sectors. Yeah. This, uh, was it 103 billion yeah. in uh, the FX loss? Yeah. Uh, so I guess the, the, the answer is straightforward uh, mm. as far as the, what happened at the INE window? But yeah, yeah, straightforward actually. Uh, but for Dangote, I mean, you can, you can say that they are a bit, uh, they, are, they are a bit lucky. So first is, that 103 billion should have been a lot more than that. Wow. Uh, but first, Dangote had tried to eliminate almost every FS nominated loans on their books. So it means that, you know, uh, they didn't really face a lot, a lot, a lot of FX evaluation losses. On the other hand, um, all those Pan-African business, you remember the Dangote report in Naira? So Pan-African business are in dollars. Right. So when Dangote cement number is being translated to Naira, so once you see Naira devaluation, typically you will see some SFFM exchange gains, you know, from that translation. So yeah. we saw that Nigerian business standalone actually reported about 460 billion in exchange gain. So that sort of helped them neuter the impact of that, you know, um, significant FS losses that they actually reported in, in the quarter. Yeah. The Pan-African. Yeah. Sec the segments really did help as far as the revenues yeah. you talked about and yeah. now with this FX yeah. side. Yeah. Um, okay, look, speaking of FX, we've seen this FX ripple through yeah. different sectors, yeah. MTN, Nestle. Mm. Is this is this one-off? I mean, on the other hand, the banks have made a lot of money on this <laughs> as well. Yeah, yeah, we should yeah, mention yeah. that yeah. the banks have enjoyed. Yeah. So yeah, looking at all these other companies mm. that have been impacted, well, what, what do yeah. you think? Yo, so um, consumer companies, they are still going to be facing that significant FX revaluation losses uh, as long as Naira keep you know, dev uh, devaluing. And they, they actually cannot help it because, I mean, think of a Dangote sugar, for instance, um, Rotus, 100% of their input costs, raw sugar, is from abroad. Wow. They need FX to import it. Yeah. Flour meals, same thing can be said for them. Raw flour, raw sugar, and think of Nestle as well. A significant portion of their input costs 
is actually FX denominated. So as long as you continue to see this FX revaluation, I mean FX devaluation, yes, they will be reporting these revaluation losses. But for cement company, the story is different. They learned their lesson in 2017, and everybody has eliminated FX components on their on their debts. Lafarge, you know, um, you remember, I mean, they actually had almost 300 billion um, dollars, half of which was FX FX loans. So wow. they tried to pay it down mm. significantly. So today, Lafarge has zero FX. Uh, loans on their book. Dangote has only about, I think, 10% of their loan in, in FX. Uh, Bua is actually quite exposed now, uh, but I mean, I'll actually wait to see their results to see how that, would, that, how that impact um, their numbers, right? But for cement companies, um, we are not going to be seeing these revaluation losses you know, going forward uh, because obviously they've reduced that exposure from loan side of things and some of their cost base too. They've actually tried to start sourcing in Nara, right? Um, but consumer company, yes, will continue to see you know, significant revaluation losses on their books mm. because you know they just can't help it. We can't, um, you know, um, in 24 hours start producing raw sugar from Nigeria. Right, right. Yeah, so makes sense. Okay, so what about the stock? I think 3:32 is where uh, Dangote Cement closed on yeah. on Friday. Yeah. I think it's up about 38 yeah. percent or something. Yeah. Well, well, what's your your outlook for this? So, Dangote? so what is driving Dangote Cement stock is not really fundamental. Um, I've, I've been in trouble for saying this in the past, but <laughs> I mean, the truth is always going to be the truth. Yeah. The driver of Dangote Cement share price is actually the buyback that they've announced, okay. right? And even as far as I'm concerned, I'm not even impressed, right? Um, buyback was announced in around 2018, 2019, and up until they said they were going to be doing up to 10% of their share outstanding. Mm. That, that's what they want to buy back. But between then and now, they've only bought back around roughly 2%. So going by this run rate, so it will take Dangote about 10 years to, <laughs> to buy back the agreed, you know, share uh, buyback that they, they promised that they want to do, yeah. right? So, uh, so I think management is actually quite smart with the way they are coming to the market to announce it. So, so once price is stuck at a particular level, they will come to the market to announce, market will be excited about the uh, buyback because it's a form of dividend payment, right? right? So I think as long as they keep announcing that, that they want to do, um, market will continue to react to that. And so any smart portfolio manager who wants to quickly take advantage of that, you know, short term movement, they should actually keep paying attention to corporate, you know, um, disclosure, corporate announcement for them to, you know, uh, capitalize on it. So I, th I think that's where, you know, Dangote, um, um, what that's what is going to driving Dangote share price going forward. So overall, how, how, what would you say of the, the results for Dangote that you've seen? Um, I mean, it's decent. Um, a lot needs to be done in Nigeria. Uh, maybe it's beyond their control, really. Um, but Tinobu's administration needs to invest heavily in CapEx. Uh, businesses also need to come out to start. Because I think I, I now know that business actually contribute roughly around 50% of their volume in Nigeria. Uh, private businesses, 50% of their volume. So yeah. uh, businesses also need to start to build real estate, you know, um, office buildings, and whatnot. But, I mean, between you and I, the truth is that Nigeria's cement market still possess huge amount of opportunity. Really? Uh, yes. Yeah. Infrastructure deficit is still you know, wide, as you can imagine. Um, um, housing deficit is still huge, right? Um, road network now, I think Nigerian government is, start, is now starting to embrace cement road. Um, cement road lasts for almost 100 years without repair. Initial cost may be expensive, but it's huge. It's, it's significantly beneficial versus the other kind of you know, road um, network. So they are now using cement um, to build road, and that's heavy as far as cement consumption you know, is concerned. So if you think about all of these things, all you see is that you know, massive opportunity for cement players. That's why I'm not surprised that Dangote, Bua, Lafarge, they're actually um, announcing capacity increase to just basically uh, prepare to prepare themselves for that, so what's you know, coming opportunities down. that is going to be coming in Nigeria. What yeah. about the getting, it's been called, it's the industrial, at least for cement, has been called like an oligopoly, right? Because yeah. of the high barriers to entry to, yeah. to come in. So can we see more players coming in in the future? Or are these guys going to be the ones that will be dominating for <laughs> yeah. the, the, the yeah. near future? It's, it's very unlikely. Um, already, if you check Dangote's um, H1 number, what you see is that their utilization rate in Nigeria alone is roughly around 50, 60 percent, mm. right? It means that they still have up to 40 percent unutilized capacity, right? Dangote is already prepared for any demand opportunity that is coming. They are already there to capitalize on it. Um, 
beyond Dangote, Bois Cement is also building a um, huge amount of capacity um, um, addition. Lafarge is also unlocking some, some um, um, they are debotnecking some of their assets in, um, in Ashaka and in, in Iwekoro, right? So um, my sense is that any private guy will understand that, look, it will take me a lot of time to capture demand in the market. So because of that heavy cost that, that, that you need to um, incur to come into the market versus um, also some of the heavy producer that you need to face as far as competition is concerned, yeah. uh, it will deter you from entering the market. Dangote alone can crash the market price to the point where it will chase away you know, competitor in the market. So yeah. I don't think that going into cement business right now is, is, is ideal for anyone. You have to have some, yeah. deep, <laughs> yeah. some deep pockets. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, so, we, we keep talking about the infrastructure promises about how Nigeria has an infrastructure deficit. But whenever we look at the budget performance, yeah. capital expenditure and you know, versus recurrent, we, we, the government doesn't seem to catch up, I guess because of debt and all these things. Mm. Is this, this potential for the infrastructure investments and how the cement players can possibly one day benefit from that, is that ever going to be realized? Or is it a yeah. gradual process you know, in terms of the spending on the government yeah. side? Yeah, even me, I've been saying, I've been preach, preaching you know, uh, opportunity in the infrastructure space yeah. for the since I entered this market, right? <laughs> yeah. So the, the question you asked is actually quite logical, but I mean, what, can, what I can tell you is that there is a problem. The problem is that we don't have infrastructure. Yeah. And to solve that problem, we need cash. The problem right now is that we don't have cash. But the truth is that both private guys, both governments, they can identify the problem. And so what they are waiting is the money. Like my friends would say, um, I'm ready. It's the money that I'm waiting for. Yeah. And so once the money come, um, the opportunity will come. I'm, I'm already seeing massive amount of um, investments. Um, um, uh, how do you say it? Investments. Uh, interest. Interests. Yeah. yeah. In Nigeria. Yeah. Um, think about all those governmental agencies in the US and the UK. I mean, they are now starting to see Nigeria as the next growth impetus as far as their fund is concerned. Um, a lot of money is going to, into power, renewable. A lot of money is going to hospitals, healthcare. A lot of money is going into education in Nigeria. Um, you may not see it, but um, people are actually doing this business. And, and I guess that once people see the seriousness of the government um, and the viability of this project, they will start pouring money into it. And companies like Dangote, Bua, and Lafarge, they are already ready. They are sitting down, waiting for the cash to come in, yeah. and then and for them to, <laughs> to jump on it. Yeah. What well, I need to ask you is the affordable housing um, mm. discussion. Isn't inflation a headwind to that? Because and when you think about how much you have to the importation of some building materials, mm. Mm. it's been said that affordable housing is not. Well, it's challenged, not that it's not possible, because of the cost of inputs. Yeah. How do you build cheap housing in mm. a population here mm. and for the cement people to want to take advantage of Because inflation is pushing up uh, prices. So uh, how, how do you see that being tackled? Yeah, so <laughs> at the end of the day, I mean, government still has a lot to do. Um, every time you post anything regarding how well another country is doing in Africa, the next key question people would ask is, what is their minimum wage? It's right. a valid question, yeah. to be honest. Yeah. Minimum wage in Nigeria is ridiculous. Government needs to come in to raise minimum wage. Businesses need to understand that, look, um, pockets of people are getting squeezed, and so we need to raise you know, um, income, um, income level salaries for people. Zenith Bank had already done it. I, I don't know. I don't know if that's for a fact, but I hear that they've <laughs> yeah. done about hundred percent. Yeah, you know? that's what I heard too. I'm, 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 I'm doubtful about that info. Very highly doubtful. But yeah. yeah, yeah. So um, the 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 truth is that Nigeria's um, economic landscape, our opportunity power is quite weak. Yeah. If you go to a country like South Africa, uh, when you go into one, some of their malls, you see consumer shopping. You're right. In various malls. If you go to our own mall in Nigeria, where you see people is in the eateries, people right. buying food. Right. Right. Good so, observation. <laughs> people shop in those bigger African countries, in in in, uh, in Morocco, in South Africa, Egypt, Egypt wow. as well. Yeah. Right. People shop significantly. Good shopping because they have the purchasing power. Right. So, um, I think that's where governments actually need to do a lot of stuff. Um, government is actually quite squeezed right now because revenue is not there. And I hope that you know, Bush administration would unlock a huge amount of revenue. 
um, from the oil side of things, from the non-oil side of things, so that they are able to you know, fund higher wage um, increase for their workers. And then they can also implement some policies that would allow the you know, private sector to also follow suit. And so that would also increase you know, purchasing power and then opportunity for building. I think that's why investors are not even investing in, in power as well, mm. because people cannot pay power in, for right. electricity in Nigeria. So once all of these things are in place, put by, by government, then you can start to see those investments flowing in. Most of our um, infrastructure and uh, energy analysts, thank you so much for a very in-depth, informative conversation <laughs> on oil and gas and yeah. industrial cement. Thank yeah. you so much for your time.